Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. 48 hours ago, one of Israel's star columnists wrote in his newspaper, Haaretz, the bloodbath in Gaza must be stopped immediately. There have to be limits to the devastation. He says there are definitely other ways of tackling Hamas. Joining me now to explain his views more fully is the internationally acclaimed Haaretz correspondent, the Olaf Palm Prize winner and the Sokolov Award winner, and the author of The Punishment of Gaza, Gideon Levy. Mr. Levy, in the op-ed you wrote for your paper day before yesterday, which was evocatively titled Enough, this is how you started. The bloodbath must be stopped immediately there have to be limits to the devastation. Let me start by asking, at a time when your government has repeatedly committed itself to an unrelenting tough response to obliterate Hamas, why are you saying this bloodmath must be stopped immediately? I say so, first of all, because it is heartbreaking to see the suffer of other people, no less than to see the suffer of my own people. But there is another point, and that is that it doesn't lead to anywhere. It's not like I have any doubts about the right of Israel to defend itself, to punish those murderers who murdered so many people in one day, to smash Hamas. But the question is if the suffer of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people is justified and is effective. You really think that if more people in Gaza will suffer, Israel will be in a better position, peace will be in a better position, the security of Israel will be in a better position? Surely not. Now, in that op-ed, you made three points, and I'd like to take you through them one by one. First, you accept it's impossible to let Hamas pass without settling accounts. What they did has to be accounted for. But very importantly, you add, there's a vast middle ground between doing nothing and massive bloodshed that has no point or purpose. Are you saying that Israel's response is not only disproportionate in scale compared to what happened, but also it's in danger of either losing or maybe it's already lost the moral legitimacy of its case? Absolutely. When I wrote this piece, it was a few hours after uh, the bomb in the hospital, which killed, according to, to, to the health ministry, the Palestinian health ministry, 471 people. And I was deeply also under this impression. Finally, it was found out that Israel was not involved in it, which made me very happy, obviously. But for the victims, it doesn't mean anything. And the, and the tragedy is a tragedy, and tragedies like this will be more and more if Israel will continue. It's inevitable. In a war, it's inevitable that things like this will happen, and maybe in a much bigger scale. So we better stop before. Yes, we have to find a way to punish Hamas, to, to, to bring the, the people who did really horrible things. I've been to the South twice already. And horrible sins, no doubt about this, really barbaric. I mean, 
slaughtering children and, and old people and, and women, raping, everything. But it must be, as I said, limited, limited by the international law, limited by any kind of moral values, and limited also because it's not effective. Now, the second point you made is about Israel's response. You say it has no clear, realistic purpose and certainly no answer to the question of what happens the day after. In other words, are you saying that this looks increasingly like revenge for revenge's sake and there's no strategic thinking behind it, no identified goal ahead of it? That's a matter of fact. Nobody in Israel knows. Let's say that the goal, which is a goal by Israel, to crash Hamas, to destroy Hamas. Let's say that this is achievable, even though I have my doubts that it's really achievable. You can punish Hamas. You cannot totally make them disappear because there are always new leaders and new activists and new fighters, and there will always be because the ideology is still there. The ideology you cannot kill. But let's say that this is achievable. What comes the day after? Who is going to replace Hamas in Gaza? Does Israel know who can take Gaza? Who can run Gaza in a better way? Who can be better for Israel, for security, for peace, for the Palestinians? I don't know for whom. There's no one to replace Hamas. And you don't go to such a pretentious operation without answering yourself, okay, you finished, Hamas is gone, and then what? I come to that critical question, what happens after Hamas, if Hamas is successfully obliterated? But first, what you're suggesting is that not only is this revenge for the sake of revenge because there's no strategic thinking behind it, but it also suggests that this is, from the government's point of view, a knee-jerk, a sort of Pavlovian response. It is a Pavlovian response, and it's even more so. The army has to somehow recover from the horrible fiasco of Saturday and to prove itself as capable. Here is the great opportunity to crash Gaza will be perceived as if the army is still capable. That's not a goal. And also for the politicians who run the operation, and above all Netanyahu, their chance how somehow to recover, which I don't think they have a chance to recover politically, is by presenting a huge success, a great grand victory, which is impossible, obviously, but this might motivate them. So both the army and politicians like Netanyahu who have vested interests, which are in a sense dominating their horizon and thinking. Absolutely, even though both have to take into consideration also another fiasco. Success is not guaranteed in this operation. The army is going into an unknown territory with unknown risks, with very devoted people and fighters, as we know. And nobody can guarantee that this will not be another fiasco. You know, it reminds me someone who gambles in the casino and is losing everything he has. And then he starts to borrow money because he has to, to somehow return himself what he lost. And then he loses even more. And then he is even in a bigger trouble. It might be the case. In other words, Israel could end up with a much worse problem because there's Absolutely. a real sense in which they're gambling over here. Absolutely. Look at the Northern Front. Yemen started to launch rockets toward Israel. Iran is still hesitating and considering what to do. It can turn into a catastrophe, a really existential catastrophe, if it will not be handled in a very careful and cautious way. Now, the third point that you raised in that Haaretz article of 48 hours ago is the danger of what this response could do to the Israeli people. And here you raised a very important moral concern. You said, even in the heat of our anger and frustration, we must not lose whatever remains of our conscience and our moral compass. We must not let all of Israel become Hamas. In other words, you're saying that it's Israel's moral conscience and values 
that distinguish it from Hamas, but this bloodbath is blurring the distinction. I couldn't phrase it better than you. Uh, it, is a, it is a danger that uh, the remains of conscious, as I wrote, and, and compass might really be lost, and they are lost now, in, at least in the Israeli public opinion. The call for extermination of, of Gaza, of whipping out Gaza, you hear it now everywhere, all over, not only among the right-wingers, more and more so-called leftists or center-left people start also with a real terrible call for, for, for killing everybody, for, for destroying, carpet destroy Gaza. That's a price that the Israeli society will not be able to recover from, because if we will become such a fascist society, and we are not far in any case, then what is, all, what is it all about? But you're saying something very important, which I'll underline for the audience. You're saying the desire for revenge is beginning to distort the moral compass of the people of the country. Even the leftist. Even the left. Absolutely. Now, your op-ed leaves one behind with one very important question. You want the present airstrikes to immediately stop. But there are also, as you know, some 300,000, some people say 350,000 Israeli soldiers amassed on the borders of Gaza, and a ground invasion is imminent. 24 hours ago, your defense minister said very soon the soldiers who are outside will be inside Gaza. So are you now also saying that ground invasion must not happen at any cost? Even more so, even more so. I mean, the ground operation is the real danger. Uh, because there we can really can get so complicated and so much bloodshed from both sides. Obviously, more bloodshed at the Palestinians as usual, but also soldiers by tens and maybe by hundreds might be killed. All those things should be taken into consideration before we go for it. And we, if we don't have a very clear, achievable goal, so what for? What for? I understand the need to do something, sure, but that's very nice, but that's emotional. This is not uh, rational. Rational thinking is now to, to try to analyze what can we win and what can we lose from a ground operation. And I'm afraid the price will be much higher than any kind of achievements. And in fact, as you fear, the ground invasion could join Iran, Hezbollah, both of whom, whether you believe them or not, have threatened publicly that they will intervene if there is a ground invasion. We don't know whether they mean it, but it's not worth taking the risk to see. And then we face a real catastrophe. This can challenge almost, I would say, the existence of Israel. An overall attack, unless the Americans will get into it, and then we might face a, a world war. I mean, this can get out of hands. It's Yuval Noah Hariri, writing in the Washington Post two days ago, said that if Hezbollah in Iran were to deliver a strike against Israel, which threatened Israel, Israel could be tempted to use an atom bomb. He was speculating, but do you think that's a credible fear? Not yet. No, we are not there. That's really, if everything, anything else will fail and but I can see American involvement because they declared they will not let Iran attack Israel. In this case, you don't need nuclear weapons in order to face a world war. Because if the Americans get into the picture, who knows how will the Chinese and the Russians react? And here you are within days in a world war. I don't say that this is going to happen, but this might happen. Absolutely, and it's frightening to even think of it. Let me, in that context, ask you, how do you read the advice Biden gave Netanyahu and his government about a ground invasion? Now, as you know, before Biden came to Israel, he repeatedly said Israel must observe the rules of war. But on Israeli soil, that message became metaphorical and therefore less clear. All Biden talked about in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv was don't be consumed by rage. 
And that's open to interpretation. It's not clear cut. So behind this clever, vague language, do you fear that Biden has given some sort of green light for a ground invasion, but one done within limits rather than no holds barred? I'm afraid so. That's exactly my analysis. I see the same like you do. I think that he gave a green light, but with restrictions. And you know, restrictions are not very solid and can change, are very, very elastic. And uh, it can change throughout the operation. Therefore, I'm so worried. I'm almost convinced that uh, Biden didn't say, is didn't tell Israel, don't you dare to go for a ground operation. Because would he say so, we would have heard about it. He didn't say this. He said, do whatever you want, but as you said, st stick to the rules of law, to the rules of the international law. This is a very vague saying, and it sounds more like a lip service and unless he will, he will really stick to it and push Israel and on a daily basis, check Israel and push Israel to restrain. But that hasn't happened in the two days or three days since he left Israel, has it? Not at all. Even though in the last two days, if you see what happened, he didn't went out. I mean, the whole Gaza Strip is now one big uh, catastrophe area and one big crime, what's happening there. One big collective punishment to two million people. That's no doubt about it. But Israel didn't make it harder in the last two days, ever since he had been here. But the expectation is that in the coming hours or days, not more than this, the ground invasion will start and then we will face a new reality. Before I move on, I'll point out one thing. Something that has happened is that after Israel was determined that the 1.1 million Gazans living in the north move south of Wadi Gaza, we now discover that even the south is not safe. Israel airstrikes are happening on Khan Yunus. Israel airstrikes are happening around the Rafah crossing. Israel airstrikes are destroying parts of the South as well. So this claim that they would be safe in the South has proven to be untrue and false. Absolutely. Absolutely. There is no safe place in Gaza. There is no rescue place in Gaza. And this is so tragic. People can only go to the sea. I mean, and to dive under the water, that's the only safe place. And even this obviously is not safe. The only uh, small light in this darkness is the fact that uh, Hamas released last night two hostages, not very clear what was the price, but maybe it's a beginning of something else, but uh, the chances are very small, but you know, we stick to any hope. Let me, at this point, explore your thinking further, because I think for many people in the world, and particularly in India, your thinking is important for us to understand. If you're imposed, if you're opposed to the ground offensive, how then does Israel tackle Hamas? Is there an alternative way? You suggest in your article, there is. What is it? Look, first of all, uh, it's not achievable totally. You know, we know that Americans tried so many times to change regimes all over the world, from Iraq to Latin America, from Latin America to Southeast Asia. It always ended in terrible wars, and everything which came after was worse than it was before. Take Iraq, take any example. Israel tried to do it in Lebanon, Israel tried to do it in the occupied territories to force some new regime, some new government. It doesn't work. But let's say that Hamas can be beaten, obviously. At least the military capability of Hamas should be beaten. But we will not get a full guarantee for, for no more Hamas and no more terror attacks. This we will not get unless we will open a new road which again is risky, no guarantees, but we never tried it. First of all, to leave the siege over Gaza. This should be the first step now, to let Gaza live, to, or, or to build a, a harbor in Gaza and to let Gaza live normal life. 
without this, nothing will be solved. Then I think we need an international force uh, urgently dividing between Israel and Gaza until things will, things will stabilize. Not that I'm a great believer of international forces, but I don't know any other solution right now. So those two steps, opening Gaza to the world, not necessarily to Israel, to the world, and, and putting some kind of international force can be a beginning. But these are very important suggestions. Lift the siege over Gaza immediately. In other words, that right. means also that those 350,000 soldiers should start withdrawing and retreating. And imports and exports, if I can use that language, into and out of Gaza should be permitted. And then you need an international force between Gaza and Israel. What about hostages? We saw the first two released overnight. There is a hope that maybe this could lead to more. But would you also say that we need a negotiated exchange of hostages, all civilian at least, being released for prisoners, or hostages, all civilian, being released for stopping the airstrikes? Which of the two? No, no, no. Hostages will be released only on the basis of releasing Palestinian prisoners, we have over 5,000 prisoners in Israel. Part of them are serving decades and decades and decades. Part of them are political prisoners. Part of them are prisoners who were never put to trial. So it must be a very massive release of prisoners if we really want to see those 200 hostages alive, if we will start now to play with time, this must be urgent. If we will start to play with time and there will be the ground operation, I am very afraid that the Hamas will start to execute the hostages as a way to put pressure on Israel. We better do it now in any price. In 2011, if I've got the date right, Netanyahu agreed to release 1,027 Palestinian prisoners in return for a solitary Israeli soldier in Hamas custody. You're saying something of that scale, that disproportionate scale, would have to be accepted? No other way. What about the future, Mr. Levy? During the 15 years of Netanyahu's prime ministership, Israel has steadily moved away from a two-state solution, which was the outcome, in a sense, of the Oslo Accords. Do you think a return to that idea is possible or is it now impossible because of the way settlements have spread through the West Bank? I think there are perhaps something like 700 or 750,000 Israeli settlers in the West Bank. And also because Israel has now made the whole of Jerusalem its capital. So is a two-state solution still feasible or has it been simply overtaken? It's unfortunately long time not feasible. It is dead long time. And what is so terrible is that all those people who call for the two-state solution know very well that it's dead. This is a train that left the station and will never be back. But nobody dares to suggest the alternative solution, which is namely a one democratic state between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean, one person, one vote, which is right now the only solution. I don't see it happening in the short run, but there is no other solution. You see, we face now two options, either an apartheid state or a democracy. I don't see any third way, because as you rightly mentioned, seven, 750,000 settlers in the West Bank will be never replaced, will be never uh, uprooted from the settlements that have very, very strong group in Israeli politics. Nobody will dare to, to evacuate them, and it's quite impossible to evacuate 750,000 people. Without their evacuation, you have no viable Palestinian state, and therefore we have to forget of, about the two-state solution and start a new discourse, the discourse of one person, one vote between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. As simple as this. Let me put to you a thought that occurs to many people as they hear you. A one-state solution means essentially equal treatment, equal rights of Israelis and Arabs, Jews and Muslims in one country. The problem is it's almost the complete opposite of what exists today. 
At the moment, Palestinians in Gaza are effectively locked in an open air prison. Palestinians in the West Bank are not really Israeli citizens at all. And Palestinians within Israel, and I think there's something like 2 million of them, don't have the same rights as Jews. So is it possible to move from today's situation to a situation where you really have genuine equality and equal rights for Muslims and Jews? Same question could be raised in the late 80s about South Africa. It seemed unthinkable. It seemed impossible. It, the idea of one person, one vote was exactly the opposite of how South Africa was run. And you see, it happened. The unthinkable happened. I don't compare it because in South Africa, it was 8-9% of whites against nine, over 90% of the black population. It's not the same here. We are facing 50% and 50%. It's not the same problem. But only the unthinkable can work now because the thinkable, we tried everything thinkable and it didn't lead us to anywhere. So maybe we have to at least start, at least to have a vision. I don't say it will be easy. I don't see any of the leadership that South Africa had, both in Israel and in Palestine. We need a Mandela, and the Mandela is not around at all, not. We need also different perceptions. I mean, if you start this way, with sticking to the present reality. So you're right, it will be another bloodbath. It will not work. But the idea is to change the reality. You know, there's no way that Netanyahu and his government, particularly people like Ben Gavir and Somrich, could accept this. But are but, there members of your opposition who might be willing to at least consider this? Not at all. We are not there. We are far from there. The idea of a Jewish state is maybe the most deep-rooted idea in Israeli society, and to break this is right now impossible because we have to give up a Jewish state. It will not be a Jewish state. It will be a democracy. But, you know, we have to start somewhere. Right now, nobody can lead this. But, you know, when catastrophe after catastrophe will happen, Israelis will have to ask themselves if they want to live like this forever. And if not, what is the solution? So you're hoping, even if politicians can't rise like Mandela or like the South African white president who did a deal with Mandela, he deserves credit too. If your That's politicians right. can't be like that, you're hoping that society over a period of time will accept that there is no alternative and Israel public opinion will move maybe hesitantly, maybe slowly, but in this direction. I think the Palestinian society started already to move to this direction. Uh, polls show that more and more Palestinians understand that that's the only hope. I hope it will also happen in Israeli society. Right now, I must emphasize again, there's no chance for it, but we have to start. But you're saying something very important. You're saying the Palestinian people, maybe slowly and hesitantly, are beginning to move in this direction and accept that a two-state solution isn't feasible. A one-state solution is they are prepared, therefore, to some small extent, to forget the past and together create a new future. I believe so. I truly believe so, mainly when you talk with the grassroots, not with the politicians. The Palestinian politicians don't dare to say it, except of very few. But among the Palestinian society, you see more and more realistic voices who understand that that's the only solution. This is wonderful news and it will be very heartening because at this moment of time when the Palestinians are besieged and feel that they have their back against the wall, even if there is a small minority prepared to forget the past and look to a future, that is a hope for the future, isn't it? Absolutely. Before I let you go, Mr. Levy, there's one other connected issue I want to raise with you. There is a second problem Israel faces, and presumably it has to be tackled at the same time as the one we're just discussing. I'm referring to the way your Arab and Muslim neighbors view Israel. You know better than me that they resisted your country's creation in 1948. Thereafter, they repeatedly fought wars against you. Now, in the last couple of decades, no doubt countries like Egypt and Jordan and more recently, the Abraham Accord countries have accepted Israel. 
But Saudi Arabia still has not, and neighbors like Lebanon and Syria clearly have not. But more importantly, the Arab street, the Arab people in the Middle Eastern countries have not accepted Israel. How should Israel reach out and overcome that dislike or distrust? There's only one way to stop any kind of operations like the one we see now in Gaza. You think that the Arab peoples who watch now what's going on in Gaza will ever forgive Israel for what it is doing to their own people? I doubt it. It's exactly working for the opposite direction. And that's another reason to take into consideration, another factor to take into consideration before we go for more brutal attacks, as justified as they are. So you're saying just as much as a ground invasion will isolate and alienate Israel from its neighbors in the Middle East, equally, not doing it will win a certain measure of respect and sympathy and start opening a door that will end that dislike and distrust on the Arab street. I don't want to oversimplify it because Israel did the, already quite enough in the views of the Arab peoples. So stopping now will not make Israel very popular in the Arab world because Israel is right now very hated in the Arab world. In any case, you have to separate, as you rightly did, between the leaderships and the public opinion. Because I think that Saudi Arabia couldn't care less about what Israel is doing to Hamas and would, would renew the talks about a deal with Israel after the war. But this does not mean the Arab world. This means the regimes of the Arab world. This is not enough. You have to carry the people with you. Absolutely. No doubt. You know, you're talking of a major transformation in thinking both within Israel, but also between Israel and its Arab neighbors. Does that need to be reinforced by your Western friends and America in particular? Do they need to push and encourage you in that direction rather than support you in the opposite. This maybe is the first step and the relatively easy step to call the bluff of the two-state solution by the world, because the, the world knows it's a bluff. You really think that people in the West, the ministers, prime ministers, don't know the truth. They don't know that there will never be a, a, a Palestinian viable state. They know it, but it's much easier and more comfortable for them to stick to the two-state solution. And by this, pay their lip service, and that's it. Sure, that's the role of the international community before anything else, to change the discourse and to start to speak about other goals rather than unachievable goals, which are dead. But what you're requiring of the Western world and America in particular is not just a 180-degree U-turn, but a complete flip. Because for 75 years, America has said to the Arab world, it has to accept Israel. Now, America has to start saying to Israel, rethink the sort of country you want to be so that you overcome Arab dislike and distrust. It's an, this must be an inevitable conclusion after all those bloody years which don't seem to end. But Biden didn't seem to understand this when he came two days ago, did he? So we are still far from this. As I told you, we are still very far. But you know, someone has to start it. My last question. We're coming to this end of this interview. It's 48 hours since your very bold, brave op-ed appeared in Haaretz. This is, I know, definitely not the first time you've expressed such views. But this time you've expressed them at a moment of national crisis and trauma, which is very different. What response have you got from your own countrymen and women? As usual, mixed and very stormy. Majority obviously wouldn't accept anything I write. But there is a minority who under, start to understand that, especially among Haaretz's readership, which is not an average uh, Israeli um, public opinion poll because Haaretz reaches, reaches out certain readerships and not everyone in Israel. I think that uh, the fact that people start to, to discuss, even to curse me, has some meaning. Because at least 
you know, the, the, the worst is standing water. When we continue again and again with the old cliches, this will not lead to anywhere because we saw where it led us until now. All those old cliches led us to the situation where we are today, which is a very dangerous situation. You're saying even if people read and curse you, that's okay, because at least they've read you and they will be thinking about what they've read. That process of thinking has started. Undoubtedly. Mr. Levy, thank you very much for the time you've given me. And thank you very much for raising thoughts at a moment when it can't be easy to raise them, but they need to be raised and they need to be confronted. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for having me again. Thank you. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.